we were taken out to Prospect Field, which was a satellite of the Fort, Fort Lauderdale base, and there standing on the strip was the Avenger. And as I put in my story that it was a big whopper, standing 16 foot 5 tall, with wings folded, and it was 40 feet long. Um, once I'd overcome my shock, the instructor led me climbing up toe and handholds to the cockpit. I've never had a head for heights. And I got introduced to the Grumman Avenger, which, in fact, the Admiralty had decided to call the Tarpon. Tarpon, as you probably know, being a, a fish. <laughs> it is a fish. Yes, it's kind of shark, isn't it? It's kind of shark, yeah. Because they, they wanted all their aircraft to have sea, sea mammal names. To me, it was enormous after the swordfish and albacore. TBF. A single-engine, three-place, folding mid-wing monoplane, equipped for use as a torpedo plane, as a horizontal or glide bomber, with a capacity of four 500-pound bombs, and as a scout or smoke layer. The TBF is designed to take off from, or land on, a carrier, and can be launched by catapult. Rugged, robust, huge, frightfully complicated with the number. There were, uh, I think, a good hundred switches I never used. <laughs> I don't know what they were. Um, very comfortable. The, the seating was just like one of these armchairs, uh, beautifully uh, positioned. Everything convenient, comfortable, not like the Spitfire, which was cramped and got into the smallest space and difficult to move about the cockpit without knocking something or other. And so on. The, uh, uh, the sitting in the Avenger was just like sitting in the the, the boss's sort of uh, big chair in an office. You know, you felt in control <laughs> to start with, even if you weren't. You know. It looked like a flying beer bottle. It was fat and uh, it had a conventional tail as opposed to the uh, barracuda, which had a high level tail. It was, you know, it was a much better ball surface. It was, it was so, so much more comfortable and powerful. It was a radio engine and um, it uh, felt totally different. It was a nice aircraft to fly. Actually, it was the it was the second they were second hand uh, planes from the Americans. It was the uh, model was the TBF, whereas the Americans had the more up to date, more powerful TBMs. And occasionally, well, while we were out in the Pacific, they come and form eight on you with their gunmetal blue. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, cheekily. <laughs> the Barracuda, as I said, was a absolute... Uh, who designed it? I don't know. I know it's a fairy aircraft, but uh, whoever designed it, it, it seemed to be a uh, bit put on as an afterthought. Of alterations made. It was... You know, if I need to look at a picture of it to realise what it was. Well, it technically it wasn't it, it wasn't a dive bomber like the Barracuda. The Barracuda really did come absolutely, you know, right down vertically almost. This it was in a in a, a steep dive. Um, it was a, a faster aircraft. It was um, uh, it was a well, it was a safe aircraft. It was a good, robust aircraft. I mean, they they were good aircraft. It weighed ten tons. It was the biggest. Single engine aircraft we had in the in, in, in the world then. After the Barracudas, Implacable was re-equipped with Avengers because she was going out of the Pacific, 
And the Avenger was a splendid aircraft. It was tough, it was well used, people knew about it, and you could thump it down the carrier's deck, and it wouldn't sort of disintegrate like a sea The rest, most of the rest of the home fleet, the carriers had gone out to the Pacific ahead. We were left behind as implacable to look after the turbids if need be. So there was no real reason for us to stay around, having been disposed of by the RAF. So we then uh, changed aircraft from Barracudas to Avengers. It being said that uh, the Barracuda being uh, very much an hydraulically operated aircraft in many ways uh, was not functional or was fun fully functional in hot climates so we converted into Avengers American aircraft very very different to the Barracuda uh, extremely heavy uh, didn't dive, it glided, you couldn't dive it down vertically and to that extent it was less safe but at least the wings didn't come off. Um, it was rather like uh, going to war in, a, in an Austin Mini if you like or you have comfortable seats to sit in, you know, typically American uh, and comparatively modern equipment. There was one downside in the instruments, the pilots instruments didn't always tell the truth so quite a few Avengers went over the side before takeoff. You know, the pilots would put the wing, put the brakes on, and open up the throttles and all the rest of it. And they say, "Okay, everything's fine," but in actual fact, it wasn't registering the power that it actually needed to have. So they'd go over the side. Happened to quite a few of them. So they weren't sort of God's gift to mankind, but um, in terms of comfort, they were they were they were pretty comfortable things. Having overcome all the um, instrument and um, handles and dials and all the rest of it, the instructor showed me how to start the engine, which we'd done, as it were, without actually doing it. And then he stood on the wing of the aircraft while I got the engine going, which is a 1700 horsepower right cyclone engine. And it made a lot of noise. And he stood there and waited till I'd gone through the throttle and mixture procedures. And he stood there while I unfolded the wings. And when I looked out each side of me, I could see how big this was. It was a 54 foot 2 inch wingspan. And I'd been told that the aircraft weighs 7 tons. And I was going to be expected to land it on an aircraft carrier. He stayed and had a chat with me. And uh, they're awfully nice, these chats. They were really super. And... Uh, the noise was terrific, but I felt quite happy sitting there in this lovely armchair, and um, so he said, right, off you go, uh, taxi round, get used to it, wait till you're ready, and then go and take off. Adjust your seat to the highest comfortable position. And note that you sit high off the deck. At first, you may find it difficult to judge depth. Visibility, however, is excellent. You can't see your passenger, so make sure he's set before taking off. The second seat cockpit must be kept closed and locked while engine is turning up. A good blast may wreck it. It was um, like an airliner, really, but um, the the top, the, the gun at the, in the turret behind the pilot was in line with the pilot, and you couldn't see him, of course. And behind the pilot was a station for someone to sit where the uh, radio man could sit if he wanted. But to operate machinery and stuff down below, he sat on a bench seat across the inside of the aircraft at their level, where you got in and out, if you were crew, there's a door on the side. And he had two windows, one each side, and uh, the, the gunner climbed up into the turret from there. It was quite capacious, and um, one could get a bicycle in there, and things like that, when going to the carrier, suitcases galore, 
and spare parts and so on, and which is what we did. We also filled the bombays with bicycles and things. So it was a big aircraft and plenty of room to operate all the bits and pieces. And my armchair was the most comfortable. It was lovely. The, the observer did the navigation, which I'd got used to. I could get, I could do what he did before he took over, which was a jolly good thing because if he got hurt, I could at least do something about getting back to wherever we left. Thinking back now, the only thing, of course, was in the turret, you know, in very hot weather, of course, it was extremely hot, like, you know, in the enclosed turret, compared to what we've been used to in the open, you know, with the swordfish. But uh, the Grumman Avenger was terrific, as far as I was concerned. An American cockpit is, the layout is different from an English cockpit. It's rather more organised than an English one, um, uh, but otherwise it's much the same. You know, you've got the, basically you've got the same kind of instruments. Um, well, uh, what do they call the blind flying panel in an aircraft? The, the, the blind flying panel is the uh, things that tell you the orientation of that are the same in all aircraft. So if you move into aircraft, the blind flying panel is the same. All the things that work, the engines and motors and give you other things are scattered around the place. But the electrics, something like that, the usual, they'll have a whole bank of about 36 switches here on electrics. This other. It's all very convenient when you know exactly where and what it is, but until you know what it is. Battery switch is placed in on position and the fuel tank selector valve turn to center main. The electric fuel pump is switched on and fuel pressure brought up to seven to nine pounds per square inch. Next, the starter is energized for 15 seconds. And at the same time, the electric primer is operated for three to five seconds. The throttle is set to one third open and the ignition switch turned to bolt. Finally, after making sure the propeller is clear, the starter is engaged until the engine runs smoothly. I was given pilot's notes uh, on this conversion course, and we all sat and studied pilot's notes, and eventually they were called out and said, right, there's an Avenger, go fly it. Yeah. They took us up, and we sat in the cockpit, and he said, <laughs> thousands of switches, knobs, tips, bars, the number of things to operate, God. <laughs> um, it's a bit like the average civilian would look in a modern uh, civil airliner and see all these hundreds of dials and things and think, how, how can you possibly operate those? You know? So you give them the cockpit check as to where things are, and you've read pilot's notes, you starting procedure is difficult. It's a Kaufman starter, which means there's a cart cartridge in one of the cylinders, which you, you press a button, having primed the engine so many times, there's no propeller turning, and you press a button, and this cartridge fires, a bit like an ordinary a shotgun cartridge, except there's no lead bits in it, it's just, just the force that forces the engine into starting. The, And it turned on to the Rapre and with great excitement opened the throttle and off we went. Um, it was a wonderful feeling and there's something nice about the aircraft from the very beginning. And with the stick forward the tail came up in no time at all and off we went. And the difference was, is up with the wheels, close the vents, adjust the mixture and get the pitch set to climb and climb we did straight to 3,000 feet and I was now cruising at about 180 to 200 miles an hour that was something different and um, it, 
behaved in a very good manner. In other words, what I mean by that is that it felt as though it would respond to kind treatment. On this uh, morning, I climbed into the Avenger for the first time, strapped myself in, started the engine, uh, and took off. I was also uh, with another chap with another Avenger, and we climbed up and uh, looked around at 5,000 feet and so on, and we'd tried normal movements, the uh, climb and the turn and the steep turns, within view of each other to see what happened and Peter said well what about the loop Ricky I said uh, yeah I don't see why not he said who's going first I said I will well I put the nose down and I I thought I might have to trim I've got a little trimming thing which which will ease uh, the power on the, the stick itself I dived the Avenger and I brought it up vertically and I was putting it vertically and I tried to get it to, to go more, to go over the top and it wouldn't do it. <laughs> so I was kept going up and up and up, I was losing speed slightly, so I put on a bit of extra speed and turned the trim tab as far as it would go and I still couldn't get that, I put it back on the stick and it was going up and up and up and up and, <laughs> like that. and then suddenly it went choof! and whipped over at the top that it was a tiny little loop on the top of a great log <laughs> long thing like this <laughs> and Peter Cave phoned me up and said my god Ricky if that's what happens I'm not going to do it <laughs> so he didn't and we went back to the bank I've never flown a monoplane before and it had I'd never flown a retractable undercarriage had all these sort of things, it even had folding wings, which you could fold from the cockpit. Um, anyway, somebody showed me the taps and what to do and what not to do, and I read the pilot's notes very carefully, and uh, was sent off on a familiarisation flight, and I got airborne. I got to 10,000 feet, and I thought, how do you stop this thing climbing? <laughs> And finally the penny dropped. So, well, obviously I've got the nose too high, I haven't got the trim right. And so, you know, I've got that hurt. And I was quite happy. And it, was, it was a lovely aeroplane to fly, if, providing you didn't want to do too many tight turns and things like that, because it got very heavy on the controls after, at, at, at high speeds. <clears throat> the power was so different. Carol Avenger, <clears throat> Wright Cyclone, 1,600 horsepower. Yes, and the Albacore was um, 1,085. So, so it's another third six. More. Yeah. yeah. And the later ones had a, an even bigger engine. And. Uh, Behaviour as an aeroplane, uh, I was so thankful so many times. The the steadiness, the absolute steadiness of that thing. I used to fly that um, feet off, feet crossed up uh, up on the cockpit bar uh, out east, uh, slipping back, swinging lime juice. You know, uh, I, no need to fly it straight and level. If once you just got it there and set it, it just flew itself. You know. Beautifully uh, manufactured and made and designed from that point of view. Now, uh, terribly heavy on the controls, of course, in certain aspects, because you're talking about a seven ton aeroplane here. And if you've got another extra ton of bombs, which we, we carry four or five hundred pounders or four depth charges, eight, eight tons flying around the sky. Um, it doesn't jerk about very much, you see, it's, it's being a bit like a bull elephant, <laughs> it's steady, and it was, but I was most grateful for that for, on many occasions.
tail wheel is locked and the friction screw on the throttle adjusted for proper tension. Full throttle gives 44 inches and full low pitch 2600 RPM. When the pilot is sure he has rated power, he eases off the brakes. The takeoff is made with the tail well down, in almost a three-point attitude. So if the tabs are properly adjusted, this airplane will fly itself off. So we got appointed to 854 after there's already been in action uh, at Hawkins for five, four or five weeks, I suppose, just before the start of the invasion, D-Day. And consequently, when I first uh, uh, got there, uh, almost the first thing the CO said to me, apart from looking at my logbook, was said, uh, have you ever flown an Avenger with a bomb load? I said, no, sir. No, he said, it does make a difference. And I was to find that out there. However, he said, all right, first thing tomorrow morning, you, you, you take an Avenger up, not your crew, you just you, and uh, load up with bombs and just do some takeoffs and landings. <laughs> I was amazed to find that the Avenger didn't really want to cl clear the boundary hedge <laughs> of, the, uh, of the field. It, it's a sloping field, you see. I was just going down here and they had a six foot high hedge at the end. <laughs> Normally I could have cleared it easily, but with this extra tunnel on board, <laughs> it needed much more stick than I would have expected. However, I did clear it, of course, but I'm <laughs> gone through your landing checkoff list. The landing approach is made at a speed of 80 to 90 knots. Start slowing down and come across the edge of the field at about 80 knots. Keep the nose down until you're 10 to 15 feet off the mat. Then bring the nose up in a steady, smooth motion like this. A three-point landing always is desirable, but a slightly tail-first landing is better than setting down on your wheels first. It's hard to avoid some bouts because there is a lot of spring in the oleos. Just hold her steady as she makes a three-point landing and runs out. Went to Chesapeake Bay where we did four landings on USS Charger, steaming up and down the Chesapeake Bay. And we had a British uh, deck landing control officer on board the ship. And um, having reached the deck, uh, before which the approach was done, putting the hook down for the first time. So it was all in the mind how to do it, having done it over land. Um, we, we, we always did three-point landings. Uh, with the tail down, and we used power right to the ground. So in other words, you flew into the ground uh, with power on. So you got into a landing attitude as you approached your final turn to the runway. And we always did what you did on the carrier after that, was you hung on the propeller as you came round, and then you only cut when someone gave you the sign to cut, and you had tail first. It was a heavy landing tail first and wheels down and you landed, caught a hook and they rolled you back to the end and as you're being pushed back I looked over the side of the charger USS charger I could only see the sea because my wings virtually filled the width of the aircraft carrier but of course there was a bit more than that and that, that really shows you how big the plane was It's exactly the same procedure, it's just that the controls on the Avenger are slightly heavier than those, well somewhat heavier than those on the Swordfish, 
and the plane is much more stable uh, than the sort of fish, which is a lighter aircraft and tends to move, move about with gusty wind or what have you. Uh, f far more than the Avenger would, which was very docile, you know, strong, brrr, like driving a bus, you know. The versatile TBF may be used for glide bombing with a 1,600-pound bomb at angles up to 60 degrees. The usual precautions are necessary for glide bombing. Throttle back to around 20 inches to prevent cooling off too fast or torching. Go into the dive at about 90 knots. And trim rudder left as necessary. We could carry torpedoes. The American torpedo was a different looking thing from an English one. Uh, and we, we had two, we had two guns in the wing and we had a, a turret at the back, you know, the only turret that you see where the air gun would be. And, uh, we carried four 500 pound bombs, which was the thing that we were using mostly, dive bombing, four 500 pound bombs. In actual fact, only once did we load up with torpedoes out of the east, because the war had altered a lot, you know. Uh, the the uh, Japanese um, uh, Navy had been fairly well destroyed, so uh, uh, we had only lo loaded up one with, with the torpedoes, and we were just about to take off, and they suddenly said, no, stop, take them off, and put on bombs again, so we didn't actually use them. And I don't think torpedoes were really used at the late part of the war at all. They were out. Then on January the 6th, we started doing torpedo runs on a fixed target. We didn't actually have um, torpedoes, we had blocks of concrete, and um, they uh, had, a, had a target out at sea, and we'd, ha we'd had schooling and, you know, uh, classwork on how to approach height, speed, and so on before we dropped and um, we flew out to uh, a ship called USS Lazy and we had dummy torpedo drop runs on her with concrete tor tor uh, torpedoes um, and skip bombing. Skip bombing was great fun because um, he went in at low levels as low as you forget on the sea and dropped your bomb and it actually bounced into the side of the ship and you went over the top. That was great fun. I didn't like to do it in real life because someone would be firing at you the other way, wouldn't they? And we also had a radio altimeter, which was rather like traffic lights, so if you wanted to fly 50 feet above the sea, you set that on the altimeter and when you were on it, it was green. When you were below it, it was red. And the amber was sort of anywhere in between. So from the point of view of mine dropping and torpedo dropping, that was a great help, especially at night. Oh dear me, it was uh, a fantastic change. You see, the surface was uh, open cockpit. Uh, with uh, Vickers gas operated guns, which of course were just uh, um, pitted with uh, pans of ammunition, you know, which you had to lift up in the open cockpit and slam them on the, the gun. 
everything done in open slipstreams and that, which no doubt you could realise in uh, that type of aircraft. But then we arrived in uh, Lewis and Maine in the, our first encounter with the Avenger, which of course was totally enclosed as far as the air gunners are concerned. You had a turret operating a point five machine gun. It was a sort of uh, luxury <laughs> aircraft, like, you know, when you compared of the, the training. A big part of the training, of course, was done in winter in uh, Canada. So one could imagine moving from flying and surface training and then suddenly training in the Grumman Avenger. And, uh, of course, it had modern, the most uh, modern radio equipment, you know, for uh, communications, if required, you know. Natalie, as you know, during the war, uh, communications was, you weren't able just to talk how you liked on, uh, on the, the air. But it had all the modern um, equipment, and of course the turret, turret, all the electric control guns, and, well, one gun, you see, it was the point five. but I mean, you could just, with a pistol grip, the thing just move this gun sideways, upwards, downwards, you know, just everything seemed so comfortable. So, in my case as an air gunner, when I eventually um, joined a squadron, was uh, communications and, of course, air gun, you know, the uh, watchful from the turret, which was always the aft side of the plane that you were looking after while the pilot, etc., was always looking for, on the head work. The, um, we did have, when we did go into operations, uh, we did have another job on the, the Avenger, was uh, what the term was the switching arrangements for the bombs. When we carried uh, four bombs, we could have a switching arrangement that you could drop the, the bombs in a certain, either close together or apart, whatever way you'd set the switch in the aft side of the aircraft. We did take part of that, that was part of our duty, as uh, you know, as well as the air gunning side. Communications, of course, was limited, as uh, no doubt you know, you see, when you were out with the fleet in that. Uh, we did have uh, very high frequency sets, which was only just a limited range, you know, between aircraft. But as far as um, other communication, you would never have come on the air unless it was absolutely necessary maybe an emergency of uh, ditching or something like that, like, you know. But uh, still, we were, when we passed out at uh, Canada, we were fully qualified as uh, as communication in uh, Morse, semaphore, flags, all this, etc., you know. Yes, it was nev never used in, in our squadron, the lower gun position, but it was there. And um, it was the um, same basic layout, pilot, observer, and, 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 and air gunner. Uh, the, the air gunner had a turret, and it was very difficult to get into the turret because the access was very small. And I recall that quite a few air gunners uh, were uh, selected out of the system because they were too big to get into the turret. Whether ever I squeezed in, I honestly can't remember. And at some later stage, they did without air gunners at all when we got out to the Pacific, or when the carriers got out to the Pacific. This airplane was not designed for any violent maneuvers, not necessary in normal flight situations. Avoid all stunts and other such shenanigans. As I've said before, we were all very, very young, and just previously on December 31st, I celebrated, celebrated my 21st birthday. By this time, I had already logged nearly 300 hours flying my Avenger, for which I had developed a great affection and respect, and retain it to this day, despite the rude comments of everyone I talk about, who call them big-bellied, plumbly, 
horrible looking aircraft. I think they were beautiful. But when I got to a squadron, operational squadron, the first thing you do is see the commanding officer and hand in your logbook. Yeah. And he looks at it and he said to me, uh, I see you did uh, uh, aerobatics uh, on so and so and so and so in the Avenger. I said, yeah, aye aye sir. And he said, did you read pilot's notes? He knew bloody well I read pilot's notes, everybody does. Yeah? <laughs> of course, uh, aye aye sir, yes sir. <laughs> Would you take this booklet and turn to page 27? Pilot's notes for the Avenger. Look halfway down the page. Aerobatics not permitted. Not in my squadron, Rickman, you understand? Aye, aye, sir. Aye, aye, sir. <laughs> if you're thoroughly familiar with the electrical and hydraulic systems of the TBF, she'll give you excellent service, whether as a scout bomber or a torpedo airplane. You can depend on the TBF to live up to her name, the Avenger.